welcome to folks. Tonight we are taping our program from the Voting Rights Act Conference in New Orleans. Now that we are in 1982, many black Americans are taking a second look at the achievements made during the 50s and 60s with civil rights and voting rights. Some feel that the gains made during the 20 years of sit-ins, demonstrations, and marches are now on the verge of being lost. Tonight we will take a look at a few of those issues. But first, excerpts from the conference's keynote speaker, Georgia Senator Julian Bond. Its effectiveness in the 16 years is undeniable. Within two years of its passage, the numbers of blacks registered in the five states where discrimination was most severe had increased by 64 percent, from 715,000 in 1965 to over one million in 1967. When the act was passed, there were fewer than 200 blacks in elective office in the southern states. Today, there are 1,813. When the act was passed, white politicians competed to see which could outnigger the other. Today, the black vote is courted and solicited everywhere above and below the Mason-Dixon line. When the act was passed, the reapportionment process in the covered states was a matter of the personal whim of a few powerful white state legislators, as it was here in Louisiana. Today, the map maker's hand is guided by the Department of Justice and the new lines drawn under protection of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Now, the undeniable progress made by black and Hispanic voters in the covered states is undeniable good news. But that progress remains today illusory and constantly susceptible to challenge and disillusion. In the covered states, black elected officials are only 5% of the total number of office holders, although blacks are 25% of the population in those states. And a long, long list of witnesses from all the covered jurisdictions, told the Subcommittee on Civil and Constitutional Rights of the House Judiciary Committee that voting discrimination remained a clear and present danger to the political aspirations of black and brown Americans. In late October, the House of Representatives voted overwhelmingly, 389 to 24, to approve the Rodino version of extension legislation. But now President Ronald Reagan has endorsed what amounts to a backdoor repeal of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. He wants to weaken the bailout procedure, wants to remove the effect standard placed in the act by the House. If the president's position prevails, black and brown Americans will be a voteless and a hopeless people once again. Now, not one of the members of the House from Louisiana voted against the final version of the act. Several of them, I might say, did vote, vote for amendments would, which would have weakened it, but none of them voted against the final version which passed the House. Now it is up to you to ensure that Senator Long and Senator Johnston cast votes in favor of the House version. You must let the message go forth that a vote against the act or a vote to weaken it in any way will send a signal to Louisiana's black voters that these two men don't want you to vote and obviously don't expect you to ever vote for them. But there are other battles which must be fought too. The voters who chose Ronald Reagan on last November the 4th did much more than simply change the name of the occupant of the Oval Office the face in the photograph on the post office wall. They began then the national nullification of the needs of the needy, the gratuitous gratification of the gross and the greedy, <laughs> and entered America into the politics of penuriousness, prevarication, impropriety, pious platitudes, and dare I say it, self-righteous swinishness. <laughs> they began then. They began marching America backward into the 18th century and surrendered our foreign policy to men who believe that all national struggles for self-determination are born in Moscow and that nuclear war is a viable option. 
Both at home and abroad, they've surrendered the general good to the corporate will. They've exchanged human rights for mineral rights. Their favored models in the world community are clients and tyrants. They prefer the hardware of war to the handiworks of peace. They're the first American government in two decades to use food as a weapon, to add starvation to the American arsenal. They intend, in fact, to use the wealth and power of government to redistribute income in this country from the bottom to the top, to consolidate wealth and power further in the, major in the minority of our population. We must act now to make next year's congressional elections 435 referenda on Reaganomics, a first electoral test of an expansive and aggressive foreign policy, an examination of the acceptability of the arrogance of power. Let us not imagine for a moment that hard times for black and poor people only began last November 4th. Now, life has never been a crystal stair <coughs> for those of us whose skins are dark, whose pocketbooks are empty. But the history of human freedom clearly shows that the evidence, the truth, and the light is on our side. You know, we like to wring our hands and say these are bad times, and these are bad times. There are more people out of work today than at any time in the United States since the Great Depression, and that's an awful lot of people. And it's real sad news that Ronald Reagan is president of the United States. But I can remember when Richard Nixon was the president of the United <laughs> States. And we came through that. It's real sad news that Strom Thurmond is chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and the Voting Rights Act has to go through him. But I can remember when James Eastland was chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and we lived through that. And we can live through this as well. But we have to do more for ourselves. We have to get over the notion that the other man's ice is colder, his sugar sweeter, and his medicine stronger. A people who believe that will never have their own medicine, their own sugar, or their own ice. I am confident <laughs> that we can endure. I am confident that we can prevail. And I am confident that we shall overcome. Thank you. Indeed, those were some very exciting and provocative excerpts from Georgia State Senator Julian Brown's speech at the Voting Rights Convention in New Orleans. Today, I have as my guest Ms. Barbara Major, who is state chairperson of the State Survival Coalition. We also have Professor Malcolm Burns of the East Feliciana Black Action, and he is also a political science professor at Southern University. And we have Ms. Joy Clemens, who is a noted Louisiana civil rights attorney from Lake Charles. And today we'll be discussing some of the topics that Senator Julian Bond spoke on here at the Voting Rights Convention in New Orleans. Hey, Professor Burns, um, Senator Bond, in his speech, he spoke of uh, a new system that's being devised to weaken or dilute minority voting strength. Can you elaborate on that to some extent? I think the new system is already being put into place. It was actually being put into place even before the, the consideration of apportionment in the Voting Rights Act. There have been attempts to intimidate black voters already. Uh, there have been um, attempts to lessen the number of black commissioners we have in our elections. And with the reapportionment of almost all governing bodies, which will be taking place next year, an attempt is being made to undo our gains of the 70s, mm -hmm. to create uh, districting plans which will lessen uh, the chances of us electing our fair share of black elected officials. Mm -hmm. Ms. Major, uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, returning to the streets. The senator also spoke of um, in progress and struggle, and nothing has been accomplished without returning to the streets and really protesting and marching and demonstrating. Do you foresee minorities, blacks in particular, having to do this to change their equitable share of justice in this state? It, it would be just stupid for me to say that we will not have to return to the streets. I think historically we have to look at where the Voting Rights Act was won, and it was won in the streets in Selma, Alabama. And if it, it takes that, because right now we're very clear on what the political climate is in this country, and, and understanding that climate, we will leave no stone unturned, as Reagan has done, to ensure that, that our rights are, are enhanced. 
and we will not go back and whatever is necessary to ensure that those rights to ensure the guarantee of them then that will be done and, and people at this conference have made that kind of commitment we'll do it through the courts through demonstrations through whatever is necessary i think uh mayor carthan summed it up when he said give me the ballot and i will determine my destiny and people are very clear on that point uh, that we will if we don't are not given that that piece of political pie that ballot then we'll take it because we're here to stay and we're not going anywhere would you concur with the fact that uh, I've heard an NAACP official say that if you take away the ballot, the only thing left is the bullet. How far do you think uh, blacks will be from resorting to that? You know, that will depend on how far down in the garbage can people are willing to go. And I think Miami demonstrated how far down we're willing to go. We're almost at the bottom now. There is nothing else left. When you pull the bottom out of something, everything else falls, and blacks are at the bottom. If you pull us out, then everything else will fall. We are entrenched in this country. We will entrench ourselves in this government. We will take part in it because it is our historical right, just like it is anybody else's. Okay, Ms. Clemens, uh, you're a civil rights attorney. The senator spoke of uh, Section 5, the free clearance of the Voting Rights Act. Can you explain the significance of that section in particular? Well, significantly, that particular provision of the Voting Rights Act, in my opinion, is, is probably the most important provision. Basically, what um, it entails is that in anything that could possibly have an effect or a change upon your right to vote must be pre-cleared through the Justice Department of the United States. Uh, that would include uh, changes in uh, voter qualifications, changes in registration, changes in the polling stations, along with reapportionment of uh, the state legislature or the, the local police jury or school board or whatever. And uh, at the time that the plan or the proposal to make these particular changes is made, then that government, that particular government body who's pr uh, proposing to make the change must submit to the U.S. Uh, Justice Department the change that it intends to make, uh, all supporting data, for that change, and also the burden is upon them at that time to show that this change will not dilute or take away from minority interests or their right to vote. Uh, from that point, the Justice Department has 60 days in which to lodge an objection to the plan or the proposed change and say, well, no, we think that this, this proposal, this uh, plan, has a, a diverse effect on minority interests or it has the effect of diluting the black vote a minority vote or whatever the case might be. And if an objection is filed by the Justice Department, then they have to go back and have to reevaluate and come up with something different. Uh, it avoids federal litigation in court. So it could save everyone a lot of time, effort, and money. Okay. Dr. Burns, uh, you being a political science professor at Southern, the posture of the Justice Department seems to be shifting from one end of the spectrum to the other. Uh, how, uh, I guess, impacting will this be on the Voting Rights Act extension in terms of the Justice Department and their, so to speak, uh, big brother uh, position? We, of course, don't know exactly what the Justice Department will be doing with all of these plans that will be sent forward to it in the next few years under the 1980s reapportionment. We do know that the Justice Department has in recent years been very slow to respond to complaints under some section of the Voting Rights Act. It's been almost impossible to get uh, federal observers uh, to come in elections in recent years. As far back as, as 1969, uh, it became more difficult for, the, for us to get federal observers. Uh, and those federal observers who come simply record information and then leave and go back to Washington. We have never been able to get in our area an election overturned mm -hmm. or indeed even such a visible federal presence which would encourage discourage those who wish to intimidate our voters so that if we speak of the justice department turning its gaze it, it did that a long time ago uh, we are naturally concerned that the new justice department will not even be as active as the justice department has been in the past that they will take this massive number of reapportionments sent to them as an excuse, perhaps, for not looking at each of them carefully. 
Yeah, so, so that's our concern, and it, it is very serious uh, given the past record of, of inattention to some of our complaints. Okay, one last question. We have one last uh, minute here. I'd like to ask you this question, Barbara. A lot of people have said that the voting process is a long, drawn-out process, and that's never going to get the equality that blacks and other people deserve. People, some people are thinking of a violent revolution. Is that the answer, or is the voting of the electoral process the answer, in your opinion? We are willing to try the system that is structured for us. I won't say that I possess the answer. I think the mood of this country and the decisions that will be made by the congressional representatives and the president will determine what the answer will be. Okay. Thank you all for being my guest today here in New Orleans at the Voting Rights Convention. And indeed, voting rights is an issue that we all need to be concerned about. Back to you, now, Sharon. Thank you, Robert. I think everybody will agree that our struggle for justice begins within ourselves. And many times our relationship with others has a great impact on our impression of ourselves. Black women have always been in a very peculiar situation. Many times they have not only had the responsibility of getting their own lives together, but that of their children and men too. During last summer at the Hediana Black Women's Conference, keynote speaker Barbara Omolotti talked about sisterhood, the struggle, and their impact on our men and on the women. But we must claim some responsibility for the immaturity and backwardness of our men because we've allowed them to oppress us. We have allowed them not to grow and to be free themselves because we've allowed them to become dependent upon our dependency on them so that they often are unable, we, we don't allow them the, the best of our thinking and our strength and challenging them to grow and become better people than what they are because we feel that they, because they raise their voices or we may not have them as lovers, they're gonna leave us if we begin to challenge them and help them grow. And so we've allowed that kind of, that notion and that immaturity and backwardness in our men. As we begin to free our minds and bodies and reclaim that, um, we have to begin to purge out some of a lot of the dependency and a lot of the the ways in which we do not help and build powerful relationships with our men as well as within ourselves and sisterhoods of struggle that the formations of sisterhoods of struggle they must facilitate that move um, they must help women study and research and observe the world for themselves now there have been many parts of our community um, both religious and political that I remember there was a time in the 70s where if you said you read Marx in certain circles, they would tell you, you can't read Marx because he's white. They, that's a white man, so don't read him. Um, they tell you you shouldn't read feminist work because that's white women. They told us that um, we shouldn't read Michelle Wallace's book because that was written by a black woman, but she wasn't correct, you know. Um, some said, you know, it was real pleasing to hear that one of the women, in, in, uh, you know, said that she took ballet lessons. And so there was, you know, you're not supposed to take ballet lessons. You're not supposed to go to concerts because that's European. Somebody told me I wasn't supposed to do Tai Chi because that was Chinese. And then I wasn't supposed to go to China because that was in Africa. But we have a right. And this is very key if we're going to develop the kind of theory and practice for black women to move. We have to demand and affirm the right to explore any and every aspect of the world that we live in. Anything you want to go and examine and look at, black women should do it. And we should never allow anyone to stop us. I do a lot of teaching of black women, and always in one class, a marriage is broken up. Why? The brother did not want the sister to go to college. Did not want her to learn. And no one should, in, anyone who loves you should want you to know everything there is to know, and validate and, and support that. So that as, as sisterhoods of struggle begin to develop, increasingly we have to encourage women to go out women who don't have children and, and don't have certain kinds of family responsibilities, they should be encouraged to travel. Go anywhere you want. Go see what the world is like. Maybe that can help some of us who have children. I know when I, even though I had children, I still traveled and went to, I even went to China. But sometimes, you know, a lot of younger sisters who have not been married, have not had children, they feel like they, their world is, 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 
is not important, they're not significant, but there are many, many things that we can encourage those sisters to do that we may not be able to do um, ourselves at that particular moment. It doesn't mean that everything we're going to do is correct, okay? It doesn't mean everything you do is all right because you are a black woman doing it. But sisterhoods of struggle have a responsibility to struggle with those sisters who are seemingly moving in these destructive patterns, and maybe they're destructive to themselves or destructive to others. That's the place of an organization of black women. At the same time, we have a tremendous capacity as black women to work and be strong. But sisterhoods of struggle must give us rest and space. It means that sometimes you see sisters like Tayari and some of the other sisters, I don't remember their names, have been working on the conference. Well, next week is the week, it seems to me, for them to rest. You know, that's the week for them to rest. Um, and that, there should be no problem with that, both within ourselves and with others, after we've done something real good, to take some time out, to cool out. With that last note on relaxing and just plain old cooling out, getting into shape may be one way to get rid of some of those everyday tensions. During the next four weeks, Carl Williams, athletic trainer at Southern University, will talk about getting into shape. Carl? Hi, I'm Carl Williams, director of sports medicine at Southern University, in charge of injury reconditioning for all athletic teams at Southern. Tonight we're going to talk to you about getting in shape or the conditioning aspect of our lives. As you know, it is very important for average America to get into shape these days. I'd like for you to understand that for health reasons, it's very important to get an exhilarating feeling mentally and physically. It's very important that you get into some form of shape. We like to think in terms of the recreational outlets that it provides us in getting into shape. The kind of people that you're gonna meet, making new friends, and getting along with people who are doing the type of things that you wanna do. There's also a tension relieving aspect of getting into shape. After working in the office all day long, after working in the home, a housewife, taking care of the children and running all the chores that have to be done, you're very tired and you need an outlet. You need something to relieve the tension. Getting into shape is probably one of the finest things that we could do. Big business has recognized the importance of getting into shape because they have built large gymnasiums within their complexes where people at lunchtime, before they come to work, during between shifts, can go and work out and do just about everything. They can jog, they can swim, they can work out on the mat, they can work out with weights. They can do just about everything imaginable from the standpoint of getting into shape. So getting into shape is very important to us, America, and it's something that we all need to look at. If you think you should get into shape, then at the end of this program, take a long look at yourself. Get in front of the mirror and take a good long look. Look from all angles and determine for yourself if you need to get into shape. And if you come to the conclusion that you do, then tune in next week and we will tell you who should get into shape. Thank you, Carl. There's one member of our staff who you'll probably never see. It's associate producer Greg Mooring, who is also the videographer. Well, we let him loose one day, and he went to the foothills of Alexandria to find a piece of Louisiana history which is often forgotten about, but very important to us today. People would be come, coming from miles around by wagon, by mule back, by horseback, and you'd see the fiddler come in. Sometime he was riding in a buggy, sometime he was walking through the underbrush with his old fiddle. And they'd all meet here and they'd have a Saturday night get together, a big old Saturday night country dance. Everybody was happy. Everybody had a good time. There's always a jug hid out under a tree somewhere for the guys, and the gals were making pies and cakes in the kitchen and, and uh, flopping their 
long tail dresses and telling about something that happened when they was a girl. Everybody, it was festival time, and everybody was having a real good time. And this spirited, I think, uh, caused, and from this was created, the country music that we love today. Here at Sharp, Louisiana, stands a building that was built by the community back in the Depression. Back during the, the Depression, the federal government had a program on that they went through the, the Hill Country communities, organizing them in the community to uh, make mattresses and make pillows for themselves, teaching them how to, to use and, and uh, preserve what they had. This building here was built by the men of the community. They went out into the, the woods here and cut the poles and, and constructed this building. And it was used for 30, 20 or 30 years as a community canning house. After the building was constructed, then relief people came in and the federal state government furnished the jars and the lids. And the people would furnish the vegetables that they put in these jars and the relief people would teach them how to can to preserve this food for their families well that is our program for tonight but before we go i'd like to restate something that has been said over and over again at this conference don't take your right to vote for granted if you're not a registered voter please go out and register tomorrow it's your duty as an American citizen. See you next week.